Welcome to this edition of the PastorCast. I'm your host, John Muzika, and we're glad you've joined us. The PastorCast is designed for pastors and church leaders, and it's our goal to bring you information each month that you as a pastor care about. On the PastorCast, we often discuss topics that don't get covered in seminary, talking about construction, financing, architecture, real estate. Uh, we also bring in experts like Jim Tomberlin when we're talking about multi-site, um, Will Mancini. We talk about church planting and revitalization. If you have a specific topic you'd like to hear discussed, please email us at info at thepastorcast.com and uh, we'll get an expert in that field uh, here for you. Today, I'm really excited to welcome Josh King back to the PastorCast. Josh joined us in 2014, and at that time we were discussing the established church with Sam Rayner. Uh, Josh leads FBC Saxe, also known as Saxe's Church in Saxe, Texas. He's a church revitalization, oh, let me say that again, church revitalization catalyst uh, with the North American Mission Board, and he's doing the same thing that he coaches others to do in his local context. I really love Josh. Uh, he's, he's doing a great work there in Saxe. Uh, he's also a runner. He's a designer of cool church graphics, which uh, maybe we'll talk about some of that, Josh. But, but before I t welcome him officially, I got to say, in May of 2016, Josh was listed on Tom Rainer's Young Influencer list with Lecrae. So, okay. um, so that, that's pretty cool there, Josh. So welcome to the Pastor mm -hmm. Cast again. Yeah, I got to say, you picked out the one thing in, in this world I've ever accomplished. So I appreciate <laughs> you sharing that. Well, you know, you, you joke about that, but I do want to say the work you're doing there in Saxe um, with FBC, with First Baptist Saxe, um, you're encouraging a lot of people, whether you, whether you know it or not. Josh is also the new host of the Texas Church Cast, uh, a new podcast for pastors here in Texas. Um, and and may, maybe you have some listeners from outside Texas. I don't know. Um, um, yeah, I would doubt if they did start listening, I doubt they'll stick with it because <laughs> we are pretty Texas centric. Yeah. We are pretty Texas proud. Hey, uh, I love uh, listening to you with Steve Besner the other day, and that was a great uh, discussion of things happening in Houston, um, I love all guy, things yeah. Texas, Texas Rangers and brisket. You'll, you'll have me all day. So, um, really right. in your pa your, your, uh, podcast there. So I want people to follow you there and listen to your podcast. Um, and you can follow Josh on Twitter at, at Joe Wiki, J O mm -hmm. I K I. So, um, man, Josh, I'm really glad you're here. And, uh, when we did this before we were really focused on Sam Rayner's book, about obstacles in the established church, but um, just watching you and chatting with you about helping pastors um, through revitalization, um, you've been or just, I just love every time we've had chats. And so I wanted our listeners here on the pastor cast to, to uh, hear some of that from you. So, mm -hmm. you know, we know the stats, we know that 80% or 85% of churches in America are decline or flatline plateaued. Um, and, and that's a real statistic. And so um, there's a, I think there's a real push. Um, how do we change that? So as you work with pastors that are working to revitalize uh, these churches, what's kind of the most common denominator you're seeing in these situations? Yeah, that's a great question because um, if, you can, if you can diagnose the problem or even see it coming, then we can prevent it. And like anything else with medical issues or any sort of financial issues, if we can prevent it, that's going to help us quite a bit. So some of the statistics or some of the designators that we see that happen a lot in the North American mission board work that I do or here in the Dallas area is a debt. That's going to be probably your number one. Um, just it, everybody has that almost every church that's dying has that. And so it's not a manageable debt. It's a large debt. So you're talking about situations where you have less than a hundred people, but maybe $3 million worth of debt. Mm -hmm. And um, there's no way to bring that in. And I'll tell you, it starts back with that whole, if you build it, they will come sort of vision. And so a lot of pastors are leading their churches to build these massive sanctuaries or massive, um, you know, and, and now it's not even the sanctuary. It's not the thousand seat sanctuary, but it'll be the 500 seat sanctuary with a lobby. That's twice the size of the sanctuary and then a coffee bar and, you know, high end technology and those sort of things. Church will go into debt for those. And what happens is that the debt starts to take over. You have to cut ministry personnel or ministry budgets in order to pay for that debt. 
and the people aren't coming in to increase the income. And so those start, those things start to spiral down. When you cut that ministry, when you cut, when you cut that staff person, you lose another handful of people. The money goes down, you got to cut more, you got to keep going. So number one, you got to get that debt under control. And that's always something that's a real challenge. There's um, also a disconnect from the community. So not only are they in debt, but they're not reaching their community. They're still trying to reach the people that lived there 20, 30 years ago. And you and I both live in the Dallas Metroplex and the, um, the Metroplex was expanding. And now there's a re, uh, you know, some people call it gentrification or whatever going on in the inner circles. And so there was one shift and it feels like the shift is happening in reverse and so the church needs to be aware of who's living around them and in order to connect with those people. So if your average age in your city is 32, but the average age in your congregation is 75, then you've disconnected um, from the community. And that's just an age generational gap, but you've also got linguistics, an English speaking church and a Hispanic community or, or, you know, other factors similar to that here. We have a lot of Vietnamese here in, in Saxe. And so, you have a predominantly English speaking church. If we had no Vietnamese, then I would, I would be concerned about that. So sure. the two major factors are there. The third factor is just a, a, um, a move away from the Bible. And these are deeply unhealthy churches. They don't practice church discipline. They don't practice meaningful membership. They don't have a plurality of elders. And um, so there's a move away from those things. And that's really, regardless of your denomination, there's a couple factors there that the Bible needs to be preached. And, Without fail, churches that have moved away from the Bible and have membership doesn't matter anymore. Mm -hmm. And there's no sort of thing as church uh, discipline, which those things go hand in hand. The church will start to die. It's got a cancer in it and it will start to die. Sure. One of the things I encounter, um, the pastor cast is sponsored by Service Realty. And I've been doing this work for 10 years, working with churches, encountering churches in areas where the demographics have changed around them. Mm -hmm. um, Dallas is a really good example. There's areas where there was a Methodist church on every corner um, mm -hmm. and they were all built in the 1920s, 1930s. And it was because that was the area that was booming back then. And then over the, over year, over the years, the, the, the children that were born there moved north to the suburbs like Plano and Saxe and Frisco and McKinney and all that. And so they moved out of there. So the the demographics of East Dallas changed where they were mostly older folks um, mm -hmm. started to change from more Caucasian to Hispanic. And a lot of those churches were not able to change um, to reach the people around them. And I think mm -hmm. that's a huge factor. Uh, many of those churches were out of debt. Um, they no longer had debt because they were around for so long. But, mm -hmm. but the, the, the common thing I saw there is they didn't change. Um, maybe sometimes they tried but they maybe tried to do it their way. I know I've learned something here recently with how we're, we're looking at our website in a new way. And instead of us doing it, we're finding out what the people who are experts in that area and the people that consume our website are looking for. And I think right. the church in a lot of areas has failed to reach when the, when the demographics changed around them. And I'll tell you, there's many First Baptist churches across the country and in Texas that really struggle mm -hmm. with changing demographics. Mm -hmm. It's also other denominations, but that has been a consistent thing I've encountered. Of how do we change with, with a changing demographic? Yeah, and a classic example of that is, let's, let's just take the, in Texas, we have a lot of Hispanics. And so a community that was once predominantly English speaking is now predominantly Spanish speaking. So the church rightly says, we've got to do something about this. Mm -hmm. There's been a number of different approaches. One is to just you know, help to fund a church plant in the area. And that's fine. I think that should happen. So you plant a, um, a Spanish speaking congregation somewhere in the area. That's great. That allows you to just keep doing who you are and be who you are, but it's not going to fix your death issue. Another thing that they try to do is bring a uh, sort of like a Spanish translator into the congregation. And so you'll have an English service and the people are listening through a Spanish um, in earpiece or something like that. And I find that that's not actually reaching the people that's forcing those people to come into your culture and then learn your language. The live translator just makes both, both languages upset. The English have to stop for Spanish, Spanish have to stop for the English. And so um, there are a number of re ways in which people try to, if you're going to change, if you're going to grow, you're going to have to let loose 
of the old and go towards the new. And that may mean hiring Spanish speaking pastors and hire, having services completely in Spanish. And it may even be that the main service, the 10 o'clock hour, the 11 o'clock hour, whichever one it is, is in Spanish. Yeah. And the English service moves up to nine if there is a designated English service. So sure. um, people have to let loose of the way it was in order to reach the people in their community or move out. And a lot of churches used to do that. Some waited too long, um, but that is an option if you want to stay the way you are, but you got to do something. You can't just sit where you are. Yeah. I, I, I encounter and ca- counsel those churches to really ask those questions, those missional decisions mm-hmm. uh, as opposed to emotional decisions. Um, emotionally, I'm tied to my building. Emotionally, this is our place. This is how we've always done it. It's time to maybe take a new look at how we're doing it and asking, is hiring a a speaker of a different language, is that maybe the better way to go? Is there a better way to accomplish the mission and vision we have to reach people in our area? Um, And so that's uh, that's something that I see that's really common. Um, That's good stuff, Josh. How about this? I've seen this, and I think uh, we, we chatted about this before we started today. My question was, can a young pastor revitalize a church that is mm-hmm. older than he is? I saw a story of a 20-year-old pastor who was trying to revitalize a church that had been around for uh, over 40 years. So wow. um, process that with me a little bit, what you see um, with a young pastor trying to start over. Yeah, I mean, most definitely he can. I took First Baptist Church Saxe when I was 28, and uh, most of the people were much older. In fact, when I was talking to the committee about coming here, I asked them about the demographics, and it said, we're about 100 white hairs and bald heads. That's, that's how they described themselves. And so I was 28, young family, two kids, um, two very young kids, and we came into this congregation the challenge of that is trying to relate to them, trying to help them lead and value the things that they value, um, or at least understanding why they value those things so that you can maybe move them off of them or keep them, whatever. That's the challenge to the young guy. Now, that's the downside. The upside, I think, is much more um, beneficial. So, um, one of the problems with a lot of these dying churches is that they are literally dying. The people will die here very soon and they'll be buried and they'll be gone. So you need to reach young families. A lot of these communities that have the potential for a church to revitalize are in communities that are younger. So if there is a young pastor, then you at least have that family there. He has the beginnings. He can use his children's activities. So if you're on a soccer team, that's where you start reaching out to. And so I started leading small groups here. I led a small group myself and um, that was a catalyst for growth because our family was young. We were reaching out to other young and as we got more and more and I passed that off to other young adults, um, men and women who were coming into our church, we put younger people into leadership, those sort of roles. Then yeah, that potential is there and it's one of the best things. I often hear people say, in fact, I was just talking to a guy who's pastoring a church and Rhode Island just a week or so ago. And Mm -hmm. his number one request was, I told him, I said, let's pretend I have a magic bag and I can pull anything you need out of this bag. What is the one thing you need? And he looked me in the eye and he said, I need two young families. That is all I need. Two young families that will help us reach this community. So um, I think young guys can revitalize churches much older than them. Um, Our church was 60 years old when I took it and um, they can help turn that thing around and make it into a fresh, um, a fresh thing. I will also give you a, um, maybe throw this out there. This is something that is often true, but often forgotten. Um, I was serving at a church. I'm debating on whether or not to say the name of the church. There's a church in the Metroplex area. um, Very nice, nice uh, suburb of the Dallas, more of the Fort Worth Metroplex area. And, Um, we were making a move. We were making this, I was on staff there. I wasn't the pastor, but we were making a move and our senior adults were fighting us on the move. Uh, we weren't moving locations. They were just fighting us on this decision. Hmm. Well, one of the older staff people who had been on staff there for, I don't know, like 30, 40 years, he jokingly made mention of all of the people that were fighting us on that decision 30 years ago were the people that were fighting the old people on decisions. He said they just 
they were the catalyst of change. They used to be the ones that were moving them and they moved them all the way across town, built a new building. I mean, they did these huge changes and I think we were trying to change the size of the bulletin or something like that. I mean, we weren't even really trying to make a big change there, but they fought us on it. So if you can remind people that, yeah, 20 year olds change things. That's what you did. That's what we're doing. And it, it kind of helps. I was getting a lot of pushback here when they were looking to hire me because I was 28. And one of the older, probably our longest running member, he pointed out the last 28 year old pastor we had started this church and stayed around forever and was the best pastor we ever had. So they almost didn't hire me because I was 28 until he reminded them that the best pastor they ever had was 28 when he started um, with this church. So you got to remind them that they were once that age. Then you got to remind the young people that you will one day be that age. And so it helps everybody kind of come to the middle and do what they need to do. Uh, I'm just going to give you a shout out to your Texas church cast. Cause I listened to one of your episodes of two weeks ago when you and the past, the pastor that was your guest were talking about the fact that, um, you know, churches, uh, some pastors taking a step and taking another step a few years later and another step a few years later. And I think what you just said that that pastor mentioned or, or that member mentioned about that 28 year old pastor that started this church and was here for a long time. And mm-hmm. probably what I bet they see in you is somebody who's committed who says, hey, man, mm-hmm. I, I'm here for you. I care about you. And whether you're there five years, 10 years, or 20 years, um, I think a lot of these churches need somebody who, who really cares about them and is really plugged into saying, hey, let's take this next step. Let's not be mm-hmm. wasteful of the ministry we have, the opportunity we have here, um, mm-hmm. and bringing that fresh approach. I mean, I think you've done that. And and that was something that I heard on your on your podcast the other day that just I really rang out loud and clear to me as I was listening to that, that we need more pastors like that who are really dedicated to, to be in there um, for that church and for those people and to call them onward. And that's really what that member was doing. He was calling them onward to say, guys, you can't let this be the stumbling block. Right. They really thought, well, because I was so young, I was not going to be here very long. And sure. um, they, they swore I'd be gone in two years. It's been five and a half years. I haven't left yet. Um, so it helps. It's a, it's a thing. And I would tell other, if you've got pastors listening to this, if you're not planning on being there for the long haul, uh, then don't lead them into it. I, you know, and this, this often gets me shot at, but if you're not going to lead them out of the debt, don't lead them into the debt. And so I have, um, I have, uh, Higher, I think there's a higher calling for us to lead people through things than to lead them into a bunch of stuff as we move on to the next, as we pad our resumes with big buildings and higher attendance because of the big building, and then we jump to something else. So I think guys need to uh, kind of t- take a step back from that. Sure. All right. Um, before, we get, before we get into the next, uh, I've got a few more questions for you, but uh, let me pause. If you need to get a drink of water, do that. Let me do this quick commercial. Uh, the pastor cast is brought to you every week or every month, um, not week yet. Um, right now it's just every month uh, by service realty service realty is a church real estate professionals. Uh, we're located in Plano, Texas. Um, but we are also serving churches in Houston and in Denver, Colorado. Um, so we're here to serve the church. The pastor cast is a way that we can connect with pastors and, and really provide um, expertise that's outside maybe just the real estate field. And today we're doing this uh, on church revitalization with Josh, um, just because we know that to the church community, this is something that's real. And this is something we need to take on, not just the pastors, but really church bodies. And so we want to encourage you as a pastor um, to not go at this alone. And we'll talk about that here in, in a little bit. Josh and I have talked through this a little bit more. So Josh, what are what are the top three pieces of advice you give to a pastor that that knows they need to turn a ship around. Maybe they weren't necessarily hired to be a church revitalization pastor, but they get there, they've been there and they're like, you know what, this, <laughs> this is not the picture that was painted for me when I got hired. Yeah. So now I need to make some drastic changes. Right. How do they get, what's kind of a few things that you have quick hits for them to get started? Well, I'll say from the beginning that almost none of us are hired to be revitalization pastors. Nobody calls that there's it's catching on and it's becoming more of a thing, but I'm finding that even those churches that are going out looking to replan to revitalize, they don't know what that means. And so they're, they're trying to hire, really, they're just trying to hire a chaplain. And so 
uh, if you did stumble on that, a couple of things, and these are going to be, the first one particularly is going to be cliche, but it's get back to the Bible. It sounds cliche, but it is so very true. Just peel everything down. I'm often asked, at what point is the church so unhealthy that you wouldn't take it? At what point is the church so messed up that you wouldn't help it? And the reality, the answer to that question is there's, there's no church that is that bad. If the church has a Bible anywhere on campus, then it's got enough to take care of and to start reaching people. So I say get back to the Bible. Now, that's harder than it is. It's harder done than it is said. So you got to start preaching the Bible. If you don't know how to exegete and preach the Bible, if you're just downloading sermons, if you're a full-time pastor and you're downloading sermons, then um, take a couple courses somewhere Um, Get some help on that. Learn to preach the Bible, exegete the Bible, and preach the Bible. Also learn to follow the Bible. The Bible does speak about multiple elders. The Bible does speak about church discipline. The Bible does speak about um, a number of things. One of the big campaigns, if you want to call it, when I got here, a lot like Patrick on the the island getting rid of the snakes, that myth, um, I felt very much like that because we were going to root out and kill off any and every bit of gossip I could find. So we went on a full tangent, and I was preaching on, on gossip. I was talking about gossip. We made gossip the worst possible sin in all of the Bible. And we went and rooted that thing out because, because it was such a detriment. But it wasn't about necessarily getting rid of gossip as much as it was about getting back to the Bible, speaking love towards one another, being encouraging towards one another, um, building up, edifying one another. Gossip has no place in the church um, for that. So we rooted that out. You got to get back to the Bible, teaching the Bible, preaching the Bible. Um, I know churches that have a million quote unquote small groups. They have a quilting group. They have a yoga group. They have a CrossFit group. They don't have any Bible studies. Um, the YMCA does a great job of doing all that stuff. Let the YMCA do that. And then you do your Bible clubs. I also I often say the YMCA board of directors is not going to wake up one day and go, you know what? Churches are doing great basketball programs. Let's start baptizing and making disciples. They're not going to do that. Neither is the, uh, the city center. That's your job. That's your one job. So uh, get back to that. That may mean cutting a lot of other stuff out of the way if it's not. Another thing is to toughen up a little bit. This is not an easy job. Mm-hmm. And if you thought it was going to be easy, um, you're mistaken. Now, understandably, we go into it thinking it'll be easier than it is, but it's hard and you got to toughen up. You're the guy The when we talk about a shepherd in the Bible, which is, you know, the same thing for pastor and elder. If we talk about that in the Bible, we often think of the guy who's like, I don't know, cuddling with a lamb, just laying down in the middle of a green pasture by a nice brook. And that's sort of the image that you have. But then you look at the shepherds in the Bible, you look at David and he's killing a lion and he's killing a bear. He's, you know, they're spending endless nights out with, um, with their sheep there's the there's the shepherds alone on the hill sleeping keeping watch over their flock by night that's not fun none of that's fun none of that's good you're going to be isolated you're going to fight you're going to have to fight and so i sometimes don't understand these pastors who just their their number one objective is to avoid a conflict i don't like fighting any more than anybody else but it's the job that's I'm fighting for the church and I'm fighting against Satan. He's attacking all of this. And if you're avoiding conflict all the time, uh, he's going around you. It's not that it's not happening. You're just not engaging in it. So toughen up a little bit, learn to get talked bad about and keep going. Does not mean that you're not going to cry yourself to sleep sometimes or, or go drown your sorrows at Starbucks. But at the bottom line, you're going to have to toughen up. And the third thing I would say that you mentioned here a minute ago is stick it out. You've got to outlast this thing. You can outlast this thing. I know for a fact there are a great number of senior saints that are just beautiful, wonderful, godly people. I also know for a fact that in a lot of our churches, it is the senior adults who have got a stranglehold on the way things are. It's just, it is the reality of it that that's just how it normally happens. Well, Um, here's a little clue. If you just stick it out, you'll probably outlive that problem. You probably will. So um, there's just a natural order to things. Also, there's a natural order to relationships. Tom Rayner, I share this stat everywhere I go because it's one of the most encouraging things. Right here on my desk, there's a glass cover on my desk and there's a little stick it note right here 
that shows me year one, year two through three, year four through five, year six through 10, and year 11. I have the dates down on that. May 11th to May 2012 was my year one. On and on and on. I've got that whole breakdown because Rainer says, and I wrote this down before I went into these these phases, but year one was going to be my honeymoon. And it was, and my honeymoon lasted a little longer than year one. It went into two and stuff. But year two through three would be my conflict. May 12, 2012 to May 2014. We had that conflict in the summer of 2014. Huge, massive conflict, uh, a massive situation. And it came like a storm, mm. uh, like the sky was angry. The next one was my crossroads where I would either want to leave um, or stay. And I had to make that decision. And that was 2014 through 2015. I just went through that. And I've got to tell you, there's never been a season in my life where I was weekly trying, not just, not like something bad happened. I just felt this like desperado call. I have to get out. I have to go tackle another mountain or climb another mountain or try something here. And I got to tell you, but year six to 10 is fruit. In harvest, uh, according to Rainer, those are the greatest years of any, but most pastors never make it to six through 10. Yeah. And then past that is a greater deal. So I'm sitting here going, if he was dead on for the first three, I mean, to the date on for the first three, then let's just stick it out. And I, I can't tell you how many times I've, I've gotten an offer from churches and everything seems perfect. There's a bigger raise. There's, it's a great community and stuff like this. And there's this whisper in the back of my head where I just kind of want to see what six through 10 is like. And then sure. maybe at the end of that, we'll try to decide something, but stick it out. You do, the greatest relationships, the ones that really bless your soul happen after that time, the conflicts resolve after that time, the money fixes after that time. So I would really encourage guys to stick it out. That would be my three top things. Get to the Bible, toughen up and stick it out. That's good. You know, you mentioned something in when I asked you about the younger pastor revitalizing and you kind of hinted at it here um, about relationships and about, you know, he, the pastor that said, give me two young families. You know, I believe when anybody is starting something and um, trying to impact people, instead of a pastor trying to go it alone, um, if he can find two or three families and he mm-hmm. can train and lead them to then go do the same thing, mm-hmm. um, it's not about a pastor and his revitalization efforts all by himself. It's about him finding people that he can invest in, can disciple, and that they can then go disciple. And I believe mm-hmm. with all my heart, just from what I've seen with the pastors I've worked with, hearing what you're talking about here, it's that very simple step. Start with two, start with three, and then encourage them and grow them to where they can do the same thing. And it's going to take time. It's not going to happen um, by snapping a finger. Um, mm-hmm. investing in those people, caring about those people. Um, I was share someone shared a story the other day with me of a church that went into a community and the com- they did everything they could for the community, but the community didn't come to them. They, the community didn't join the church until about after the second year of them being there and continuing to minister to them. Then the neighbors started coming mm-hmm. and the pastor, after a couple of years asked one of the guys that joined the church, why did it take the community two years to believe and to, to come and join us? He said, well, we didn't think you were going to stay. Mm-hmm. He said, uh, we've seen other churches come to this building and come and go. You're the first one that stayed. Mm-hmm. And what that spoke out to me was just what we just talked about here. Stick it out. Mm-hmm. Be there, be faithful, build relationships with people and encourage them to then go do the same. And mm-hmm. that's how, that's the most effective thing I have seen. And I, and I hear you talking about it as you were talking about that pastor from Rhode Island, give me two families. Right. And, and, and then uh, let God multiply those efforts. So, mm-hmm. um, so I know um, we're going to wrap up here in a few minutes. I know um, you've seen this pastor and I've seen this pastor. Um, he knows the church needs to revitalize. He's preaching it and teaching it. Um, he's clearly frustrated because he's been preaching it and teaching it. Um, he's done two or three sermon series on it. Mm-hmm. There is ab- absolutely no movement in the body. The, the body is just, they're, they're 30 people. They've continued to be 30 people. They're perfectly happy with that. Um, how can we encourage that pastor who's listening today, who's, who, who knows it, knows what he needs to do, feels like he does, but the body's just not, uh, moving forward. How, how can we encourage him? 
Well, again, I would say stick it out. Just try your best to stay there. If you don't have to move, don't move. And so I would also encourage him to get connected. I am fortunate. We are in uh, the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. We have more churches, more Baptist churches than than you can imagine. And so there's a number of guys that I can connect with, but I'll be real honest with you. The guys that I've connected with the most, um, the ones that I talk to the most, one's in Hobbs, New Mexico, one's in Kansas City. I've got another couple that are over in Fort Worth, which is, um, for those of you not familiar with our area, that's, you know, over an hour, hour and a half away. So we've got connections. I got another one down in Austin. That's three hours away. I got a lot within five minutes. I can get coffee with them anytime, but those aren't the ones that are really encouraging me. So you don't have to be close to somebody. Check out online. I hang outs with guys all the time. We're online. We're talking to each other and that's, that's nourishing to me. So I would encourage you to do that. I would encourage you that there is potential hope. If there is potential, analyze the potential of the area and your church. Can your church actually grow? If you're in a community that I was talking to a guy the other day and he was talking about how he could not get this church to grow no matter what he did. And um, I was looking at the demographics, the community had 200 people and then it was 30 minutes to a town of a thousand, something like that. It's just rural, rural. And, um, and over the past, you know, several decades, the population is reducing. The highway moved away from the town. So the population's reducing as people die. They die. There's no young families there, et cetera. He's running 30 people. And I said, dude, you're reaching over 10% of your city. That's, that's a massive percentage. It, you are reaching what most guys would want to reach. Now, of course, you want to see all 200 of them come to Christ. You want to see all of them um, accept Jesus as their Savior. But more than likely in a town of 220 minutes or whatever from a town of 1,000, you're not going to run 2,000 people. It's not going to happen. So we really need to analyze that. I used to kind of poke fun at churches out in rural East Texas that would hire a full-time college pastor and they're an hour and a half away from the junior college. Hmm. And you're not going to have a college ministry in that church. You're just not. So if you can analyze and there is potential there, there is potential there. So stick it out. Keep going. Try some new things. The biggest factors in church revitalization bar none is if the pastor is biblical and if the pastor is faithful and you can do that. So if you're a guy sitting there and you're struggling through this and you're not seeing the fruit that you want to see, stay biblical, stay faithful, readjust the goal line to faithfulness and not size. And um, you're doing great. I really want to encourage you just from me, just to say you're doing a good job. So I would encourage you to just analyze those things and then stick it out. Uh, that's really a good word, Josh. I appreciate that. I know um, sitting with these pastors, hearing this, I think you're right. Don't compare to what the church in the next town is doing because their 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 paradigm is different. Their context is different, and God has you in a place for a specific reason. Mm-hmm. And um, man, re- remain faithful. Stick to the Bible. Um, and that that's just great, great advice. And and so you know, I think this is a, a huge thing for the church in America today. Um, you know, we we get caught up in the fact that there's churches that have thousands of people. Uh, attending them every weekend, and we we glorify those stories. But I really want to just uh, commend the pastors of the local churches in rural areas, and even in big mega, uh, big big cities like Dallas. There's right. like lots of churches that are um, under 500 people that are really making an impact because those people will never step in the doors of a 2,000 seat church. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's people that are going to the mega church or the giga church that that are just too scared or whatever will not go in the small church, but there's people that will come in the small church that are looking for real authentic community where they can know their pastor and they can, they can have someone that they do community with in their local context. And there's a church there for you and pastor. Mm -hmm. There's there's plenty of people out there um, for you to, to reach. And if we focus on that, then the revitalization I believe will come, but in the end, it's all about God being glorified. So yeah, um, absolutely through your church. So, um, Josh, I really appreciate this time today. Um, yeah. how else can people, I know I said your Twitter handle earlier, but I'll let you give a quick, uh, how people connect with your, uh, Texas church cast and, and, and how they can, uh, 
uh, join you. Maybe they're in Saxe. Maybe they need to come visit Saxe's church. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, well, you know, do connect with me on Twitter. I'm at Joe Wiki, J-O-W-I-K-I. And uh, the podcast, as you mentioned, we're actually going to get you on the podcast um, here shortly. And we're going to talk about some stuff like that and a lot of follow up to a lot of these questions, maybe drilled more down into the real estate and the, the debt issue. But I'd encourage all of you, if you're a pastor, particularly in the great state, to follow us at Texas Churchcast at uh, Texas Churchcast. That's our Twitter and TX instead of don't spell out Texas. It's just TX Churchcast. Also, you can find us at txchurchcast.com and uh, follow us, subscribe on iTunes or Google Play. We'd love to have you as part of the conversation and, and just kind of joining in. We're going to be doing our first live show here pretty soon. And um, so make sure that you check those out and you'll be able to kind of chat in and drop in your opinions as you wish. And whether they're good or bad, I'll probably say them out loud. So um, be a part of that. I'd really encourage you to be a part of the Texas Churchcast. Well, good. Well, Josh, thank you so much for uh, joining us today, and uh, we pray that all there at Saxe's Church, again, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I have to say this, you went to FBC Saxe, and you really formed an identity around Saxe's Church. I love right. what you did there. That was just unique, and you guys are making great t-shirts and all sorts of things with your, your background with uh, um, our, I'm going to say it wrong, but just with graphics and stuff. You've done some graphics good things for yeah. me, so I appreciate that, so um, y'all are doing great work there. I uh, want to commend you, just encourage you, and um, really thankful for your friendship and for being here today. So uh, with that, we'll see everybody uh, next month and uh, looking forward to talking about construction issues. Construction costs are on the rise, and we're going to have Tim Cool and Deborah Sweeney and maybe a couple others here with us. So we'll look forward to talking to you next month.